Namaskar. It's a great day for us because, as you know, today is the day when Tagore left his worldly existence and went to heavenly abode. We celebrate this day as the day of creation. And since morning, we have been busy in celebrating this day through many occasions. And it's a, also a great day because we have in our midst the person who manages higher education in the country, none other than Honorable Professor Jagdish Mamidala. Jagdish Ji is a friend of mine. I mean, I think I have got that authority from him, to call him a friend, because we started working together with one cause, with an identical cause. When he was the vice chancellor of JNU, I was a member of the executive council, and we fought many battles together. <laughs> Since then, we have been friends, and we are very happy when he was elevated to the position of the chairman of the University Grants Commission. And today he will speak on a topic, national education policy. And he was one of the makers who prepared this particular policy since the beginning. He was one of those ideational guru of new education policy. So when I asked him, despite, you know, since morning we have been busy and he's tied up with so many things. When I asked him that since you are coming, we'd like to hear from you about your baby, new education policy. He immediately agreed. And since five o'clock he's with me and still he's not tired, you can make out from his face. And he, I asked him, would you like to go to the guest house for rest? He said, no, 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 I'm all right. So here is the speaker, our mentor in a way, because he's handling our education, of course, in collaboration with his friends around. I can claim himself to be one of the helper in this regard. So Jagdish Ji, we are really grateful that you came and you accepted the invitation, not only from me, but from Vishwabharati. So Vishwabharati is honored by your warm presence. And when we are together in Ravindra Bhavan, he mentioned that after a long time, I'm feeling at home in Shantri Ketan. I think I have quoted it properly. So I said, why? Because you know, in most of the places I find artificiality. But Vishwabharati is a place where I didn't find that. I just feel at home. I'm with my own people. Though we don't speak the same language. Since morning and I have been acting as a kind of translator for him. But still, he, he got the kind of, you know, the emotions which coming from all of us. And he said, I'm really enjoying to a great extent. But friends, since he came here, I wanted to exploit him a little more. So I said, you have to give a lecture. And today is the 58th lecture in the university lecture series, right? And we are very happy that 58th lecture is being delivered by none other than, I mean, his chairmanship is an important position but he is a great academic. He is a professor of IIT, product of Madras IIT, and he is first a teacher, then an administrator. So today we'll see Jagdish Ji as a teacher, and I haven't had the occasion to see him as a teacher. He gave formal speeches to us, I know, online, right? Uh, but um, never ever I have seen him performing his role as a teacher on a theme which is very close to his heart. 
NEP. And I asked him, would you need any preparation? He said, no, I just would like to talk and discuss. You'll be happy, friends, if he receives questions from you. That's his top priority. He said, I'll certainly speak for a few minutes, for half an hour, for half an hour, and then he would like to have questions from you as frankly as you can. Questions, no observation, no counter paper, because we have got time constraint. So with these professing remarks, again, I express my gratitude to you, Jagdish Ji. All my colleagues and young students, they express their gratitude, their gratitude to you. And now I don't want to stand between him and the wonderful speech which he is likely to give soon. Thank you, and I'm sure you'll enjoy. Namaskar. <laughs> I looked at it back in the end. Um, I also have a connection to West Bengal. When I came back from Canada in New July, I joined at IIT Kharagpur, BC department as an assistant professor. So I used to see my friends always speaking in Bengal with each other. So I asked one of my senior colleagues, you know, whenever I speak to the public, they are speaking Bengal. What is the reason? So if they speak English, if two Bengalis, if one of them speak in English, the other one will speak out English. That is why they are always speaking Bengal. That is the long we have for your, which is, which is, Beautiful. I would like to thank Professor uh, Vijay Chakrabarti for inviting me, for sharing some of my thoughts with you. And the reason why I didn't want to speak from there is I just want to go around here. Because if you have any moving object in your front, your attention will be there. <laughs> So that's why I want to move ahead. And I'm also happy to note that uh, there are students here. And um, I will speak for some time as teachers, you know, as I keep speaking, after some time your thoughts will go elsewhere. Uh, so I will not give a very long um, talk. Even in my lectures also, now after 10, 12 minutes, I break it. And then I ask my students, which movie have you seen? And then we have a discussion for two minutes. And then I ask them, okay, let's get back to the lecture. Then they say, no, sir, another minute. So they are busy discussing about it. So I know our attention spans have become smaller, shorter. So I'll keep my lecture short. Um, when we want to talk, when we want to talk about an EP 2020, people ask, what is the objective of an EP 20? The best way to illustrate the objective of NEP 2020 is through a small story. Who doesn't like a story? You surely like a story, right? So let me tell you about the two uh, people who are making uh, statues, sculptors. They were given two big boulders and they were asked to make a statue out of this portal. And just to make it uh, a realistic story, ma'am, what is your name? Ashmita. Ashmita. One sculptor is Ashmita. And the other sculptor is Mano. Mano. So both of them were working very hard. And a visitor like me came and asked, uh, what are you doing? So what are you doing? She said, uh, I'm making a beautiful statue out of this portal. And you know, it is so difficult. I require complicated tools. I require creativity, hard work. And she described like that. And then the visitor was passing by and uh, he came to the site. This time, the visitor wanted to be a bit uh, smart. So he went there. Oh, you are making a statue out of 
for them. Then um, Mano, right? Mano said, no, 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 I am not made this. The statue is already there inside the boulder. I'm only chipping out the unwanted material to see that statue. The lesson out of this story, the lesson out of this story is that we need to self-discover ourselves. Our students have been given an ecosystem inside the classroom and outside the classroom so that they discover their inner potential. Their inner potential is not only there. So how can they discover it? That is the major objective of any being. Because the first step to become a good learner is to identify your own inner potential, to look inward, inward, understand yourself. You know, once Lord Rama suddenly became restless, one question popped up in his mind and he could not answer that question. So he walked uh, to Vashis' hat, knocked on the door, Vashis from inside, very irritated, he was about to go to the bed. He said, who are you? Lord Ram said, Guruji, I have come to find an answer to this question. Who am I? I want to know. Right? So that is the part. Is there anybody who doesn't want your students to discover themselves by looking into themselves? Is there anybody? I'm sure we say no to that. That's the object. Now, let me see. Oh, there are many people online. Okay. Um, you can't move. I can't move. No problem. I will hold this. After you listen to me, I will ask you a few questions and I would like to hear from you. The first objective of NEP 2020 is that our education should be made learning outcome based. So far, we were only giving input to the students. Teach and teach and teach. We never bothered. What is the outcome of this? How skillful, how creative, how innovative our students are becoming. That was never our objective at all. And the second one, the education has to be made more personalized, more individualized. So far, the teacher will come, teach something, and expect every student to understand and do well. But it doesn't work that way. Every individual is made different. Every individual has a different potential. So how can I make it personalized? Shall I give an example how to make personalized? Huh? Okay. So there were three kids. They went to a zoo to see a tiger. So obviously, tiger is there somewhere and there is a lake kind of thing, and then there's a wall, protective wall. These three kids went and they were trying to look at the tiger. The first one was taller than the wall, so he could easily look at the tiger. The second one was just about the height of the wall, so he could raise up and then see there, inside the uh -huh, pond there, the tiger. The third one was too short. However hard he tried, he could not see over the wall. So what is the solution? Well, the zookeeper saw their difficulty. And what could have been your solution to that? You could have brought a bench, right? You could have brought a bench and then kept there. And the zookeeper did the same thing. And all three of them stood on that. The taller one, it made no difference at all because it was already tall. The second one is now taller than the wall because the bench is helping him. So he could see. 
the third one was still shorter than the walk he couldn't try it out and that is what we try to provide to our students one fits all solution to all our students it doesn't work that way we need to provide individual attention personalized education but is that possible if i have 100 students like this in a classroom can i pay attention to every student and provide individualized education it just not possible but we should be able to find solutions and that is where technology uh, will come very very handy to provide personalized education so the third objective of nep 2020 is not only our education should be learners learning outcomes based not only it should be personalized and individualized but it should be done at a mass scale because today our education system is the largest in the world how many students are there sir in our education system from school to phd 300 million students 26 crores in the school system roughly 4 crores in the higher education system 300 million students it's the largest in the world but in the next 5 years or so the number of students who are there in the higher education system roughly 4 crores that will become 8 crores in the last 70 years we could build about 1100 universities 45000 colleges and that is catering the needs of these 4 crore higher education students if it becomes 8 crores or 10 crores can you build another 1100 universities 45000 colleges in next 5 years obviously it's not possible can you do that it's not possible then what's the way out how do you educate this additional number of students who want to access high quality higher education so we need to find solutions you can't simply raise the hands and say it cannot be done now the reason why we want to achieve these three objectives is that you know when i educate the students on a mass scale the aggregate learning in the society will go up large number of people will become skillful innovative creative then that will enhance the aggregate productivity of the society then what will happen if the productivity goes up the per capita income of the individuals will go up then that will increase the per capita wealth that will add economic value if we add economic value then we can invest more in public education you can educate more people so you have a kind of regenerative feedback in control engineering it is called positive feedback one feeds the other so how do we achieve these three objectives of the nep 2020 friends first of all we must recognize that higher educational institutions are social organizations they have social obligations so we need to first transform our higher educational institutions to maximize these social benefits because higher educational institutions are the only place where we provide bits and pieces of this vast human knowledge to our students so that they become competent higher educational institutions are the only place where research is done driven by curiosity not because of any financial gains and higher educational institutions are the only place where a young student can coexist with a a very well known researcher who is doing cutting edge research in the same institute and work together so the objective of nep 2020 again therefore is to make sure that we maximize the social contribution from our higher educational institutions 
Is there anybody who doesn't want to do that? I'm sure all of you, 100%, you want to do this. But friends, let me also tell you, when we want to maximize these social benefits out of these higher educational institutions, by transforming them into centers of excellence for their research, teaching, learning outcomes, for the kind of research ecosystem that they are creating, you should not forget about one creature. And that creature is sitting on top of the tree and watching these educational institutions. Okay, you want to transform yourself into centers of excellence and then strike on these higher educational institutions. And that creature is called the regulator. Let's call it UGC. You know, for too long, our regulators have been too rigid. They were so much rule-based. And they were bringing out so many rules and regulations to micromanage the universities. So how can you expect the universities to grow? If you want to achieve the objectives of the NAP 2020, which just now I have mentioned, you have to first reform the regulator. While you talk about institutional excellence, we never talk about regulatory excellence. Friends, that is what again NEP 2020 tells us. A regulator should be a facilitator. They should not stifle the growth of the universities. A regulator should trust the higher educational institutions, give as much autonomy as possible to them, provide broader guidelines to the institutions. And within those broader outlines, let the institutions innovate. Let them come up with the creative ideas to strengthen the teaching learning processes and research in the institutions. Friends, during last one and a half year since I took over at UGC, we had several meetings with our uh, officers in UGC. They're outstanding people, highly educated. If you want to serve the nation, serve the student community, universities and colleges across the country. First of all, we need to set our home right. And that is what we have been doing. And this involves several steps, but without going into all those details, the most important one is the change in mindset that we are here to serve the student community and the uh, universities and the colleges. We are not here to control them. So that is the kind of mindset now we are trying to bring within the university, within the University Grants Commission. Now let's um, look at some of the objectives that I have mentioned. We want to convert our educational institutions into centers of excellence so that they can maximize these social benefits. So how shall we do? What shall we do? The first thing, it starts with looking at the aspirations of our students. You know, it doesn't really help if some so-called experts sit in a drawing room and come up with an education policy and tell the students, oh, what are you, you are a student or uh, you are a student? So let's say me and Professor Vidya Chakravarti and such top experts, they decide a policy and we come, come and hand over the policy. This is the best for you, you take it. I think that doesn't work. First, we need to see what are his aspirations? What are her aspirations? As teachers, majority of you are here as teachers. I will tell you a few observations and about the students, after years of interaction with my students at IIT Delhi, I'll give a few observations. And I want to challenge any of the teacher, if you want to contradict, you are free to contradict. And I'm going to tell what is that I have observed um, in the students. 
The first thing I have observed among students is that they want to be good learners. They want to be lifelong learners. The second most important thing that you will see is that they want to be creative and innovative. And the third important thing you will see, they want to question the status quo. They want to challenge the authority. The authority could be a textbook. The authority could be a theorem, which we have been studying for decades. They want to challenge. They don't want to accept anything on face value. And another important characteristic you will see among our students is that they want to be critical thinkers and they want to be solution providers. And you will observe today, our country is the third largest ecosystem for startup companies. Um, do you have any idea how many unicorns we have in our country today? About 100 unicorns. Today, as I speak with you, we have about how many startups companies in our country? 85,000 startup companies. And uh, building a startup company is the most risky thing. It means what? Our young people like her, they want to take risks. And they want to learn. Whenever you take a risk, there is a chance that you may fail. But they want to learn from these failures and move forward. And another important thing that you will see, which most of us as teachers, we never experienced, we never thought about it. But today we know that the ability to be part of a team and the ability to lead a team are important characteristics if you want to succeed in life. And that is what our students demonstrate. They want to acquire these skills, soft skills, communication skills, leadership qualities, so that they can lead teams. And day in, day out, when I interacted with these students, I'm not saying every student possesses all these characteristics. That's not possible. Every human being cannot have everything. But they demonstrate, they do demonstrate as a collective group, all these characteristics. Is there anybody who disagrees with this? Is there any teacher? Don't you see these characteristics, these aspirations among our uh, students? Don't you think as teachers, it's our responsibility to make sure that our students realize these aspirations in their life? So don't you think we should do that? We should do that. And these are the aspirations. Now let us see the NEP 2020, whether it will meet the aspirations of our students. When we talk about education, our focus is higher education. In school education also, a lot of reforms are coming because the students coming from the school education feed our higher educational institutions. One of the things, one of the terms you will often hear when we talk about NEP 2020, sir, what comes to your mind when you think of NEP 2020 in your mind? Education policy, new education policy. What comes, what is the important thing that you think in NEP 2020? I think uh, professional approach. Professional approach. What, what is the important thing that comes in your mind? The holistic approach. Holistic approach, wonderful. NEP 2020 says we should have holistic education. We should impart holistic education to our students. But this is also highly misunderstood term. What is holistic education? The next question, I want to ask one of you, please don't keep your head down. I will look at one of you. <laughs> Ma'am, what do you think is holistic education? 
No, multidisciplinary is a separate thing that we want to do. I will talk about that. Inclusive in nature. Sir, what do you think of uh, holistic education? Any one of you? All round development, all round development. But that's a very, very broad statement. All round development. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, I know all of you, you know what is holistic education, but may not, you may not be able to find right words right now to express it, but I understand. But like Rabindranath Tagore, um, you know, some of the ideas that we are not able to express, but he can put it in a simple poem. And we all feel, oh, yes, that is what I thought. The poem precisely uh, catches my ideas. So there was a shloka attributed to Mahabharata times. And this shloka says that only one fourth of education to the student comes from the teacher. And one fourth of education comes from the student's critical thinking. And one fourth of education comes from peer learning by working in teams, by doing, uh, you know, collectively working on a team project. And one fourth of education comes over a period of time through experience. And that is what is holistic education. That you learn by doing things through experience. You learn by sitting together, by exchanging ideas, by brainstorming things, peer learning. And then you need to critically question whatever you are learning. And if you see the role of teacher, it's only one fourth. Not the kind of teacher that we expected every morning will come and write on the blackboard and we take down notes. The role of the teacher has now changed to that of mentorship. We need to be a friend. We need to be a co-traveler with our students and provide mentorship. The only difference between me and my student is the long years of experience that I have, which the student obviously because of age, they don't have. But intellectually, they are as good or even better than you because they are young people. They're much more creative than you. So therefore, the role of teacher is to become a co-traveler. So friends, when you think of holistic education, Think of ways how you can introduce these components in your, in your teaching learning process. Nobody has to prescribe. UGC doesn't have to tell you uh, it, with a 10-page guideline that this is how holistic education has to be done. It will vary from place to place. It will vary from discipline to discipline. Even from teacher to teacher, we need to design such holistic education. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with me? Now let's go to the second um, item, multidisciplinary education, right? And this again is from the perspective of the students because we want to make them creative and innovative. So I will not ask you, you are in the front row. <laughs> so ma'am, what is being creative? Precisely, creative means generating ideas in your mind. That is being creative. But then we want our students to be innovative also. So what is being innovative then? What is being innovative? She's not looking at me. I may ask her question. What is being innovative? How is it different from creative? You have some ideas. And if you can add value to those ideas, then that becomes innovative, right? So you need to be creative to generate ideas and you need to add value to that idea in order to become innovative. And once you have an innovative idea, you can make maybe a prototype device and maybe you want to become an entrepreneur. 
you take this prototype into a small production level, test it, you invest there, and then grow as an industry. So you see, if you want to develop these entrepreneurial skills, the first thing, the first step to start with is being creative. If you don't have ideas, then you cannot be an entrepreneur. But how do you generate ideas? Suppose I study only economics. I study only mathematics. That is one case. Take another case where a student is enrolled in physics, does major in physics, but also does a minor in economics. And such an area today, it's a very hot area. It is called econophysics. I don't know how many of you have heard. The physics models are used in economics to solve the economics problems. And that is being created. And cognitive science very clearly tells us that when multiple people with multiple expertise come together, then diverse ideas are generated. Can we create such an ecosystem for our students um, in the educational uh, ecosystem? That is our next thing. And that is how young people like her can be empowered to become creative and innovative. I'll give you one real experiment a psychologist did. This psychologist, he wanted to know how do scientists generate these new ideas? How do they generate these new ideas? So he chose four molecular biology labs across the globe, top molecular biology labs. And he set up video cameras there. The scientists there, they did not know. And he observed them for two, three years. And after analyzing the results, there was a startling revelation this psychologist found. And what is that revelation? He found, by the way, when you think of a molecular biology lab, what comes to your mind? How do you imagine a molecular biology lab? Microscopes, scientists with white gowns, with protective glasses, looking through microscopes for hours, and suddenly, Eureka, I found something. You know, that's how we image it, right? But none of that was found even after observing for three years by this psychologist. What he found was that when the scientists were meeting in an informal environment or a cup of tea, cup of coffee, they were discussing. Ideas were flowing from one project to the other project. And that is when new ideas were created. So friends, the NEP 2020, therefore, says that don't train the students in certain rigid domains. There are actually three important things that we want in NEP 2020. Um, wherever I go and meet the students, I keep telling them, and you please write it down. All the students, please write it down and demand this from your teachers. Demand this from your vice chancellor. The three things we want to give from NEP 2020. He's so sincere, he's already writing, right? <laughs> okay. So the first thing that we want to provide to our students is freedom. The second one that we want to provide to our students is flexibility. And the third one is choices. If you provide freedom, but if you are inflexible, then it's of no value. The student should be able to choose what they want. That is what is you know, flexibility. But then you have no choices. You have either this or that, then it's not useful. So that's why there has, there has to be enough choices for the students to make freedom and flexibility. So after this lecture is over, have a meeting with your vice chancellor and ask him whether these three things are provided to you or not in your education. Okay. So I'm going to be sticking you in my. <laughs> uh, right. So, friends, um, we have done many things for the students to provide this multidisciplinary education. Um, 
we have now launched the four year undergraduate degree program and i am glad that that is being implemented even in west bengal it's a four year program you can of course exit at the end of third year um if you continue until fourth year you can do research and in this if you look at the curriculum model you can major in one subject minor in another subject or you can major in two subjects what if you want to study biology as a major and as a minor you want to do data analytics why should anybody stop you what you want to do ba in history but you want to do a minor in international relations or you want to do in some cutting edge ai related subject why should anybody prevent you that is what i mean by saying that freedom flexibility and choices should be given uh, to our students and um, we have also permitted the students to do two degrees simultaneously have you heard of that you can join for a ba in economics but if you are a science student in your class 2 so you want to do bsc in biology you can do a parallel course if both courses are available in your university and if your class schedules do not um, clash with each other you can do that and there are many other innovative ways in which um, you can do two degrees simultaneously in fact most student may like this um if you join in a 3 years under what are you doing you are a phd student is there any postgraduate student or undergraduate student here what are you doing russian language in in uh, is it uh, postgraduate ug it's a 3 year program All right i i want to ask you a question you are doing a 3 year undergraduate program in russian language suppose i say that if you earn the required credits in two and a half years i will give you the degree will you want it or not we are letting you finish earlier than the required period of stay of course if you want a hostel you don't want to leave the hostel you can continue <laughs> you can continue but that's again your choice nobody is asking you to leave but those who want to finish early they should be able to finish early so there are many many such reforms although it's not yet implemented but i am asking students like you to say what is the reaction um but most students they say hey, why not if i am capable of doing extra credits why shouldn't i complete early right so this is one and um, the other one is i mentioned that in fourth year you can do research how can you do research unless the research ecosystem is strengthened within our uh, universities that is our second focus area friends let me tell you whenever we talk about research in the universities the first thing that comes to our mind is what does come to you to your mind ma'am when we talk about research in universities lack of funds <laughs> is it not <laughs> don't you agree lack of funds how can i do research there is not enough funding uh, but let me tell you that across the globe you always have competition to get funding for research no government no industry gives you on a platter yeah i have 100 crores do what research you want to do nobody will give you the funding is very very competitive so unless our younger faculty members our faculty members in the universities know how to write a successful project proposal how will you get funding let me tell you because i sit in the project approval committees the success rate is less than 25% if you want to get funding so and then even after lot of struggle if i get funding i don't know how to manage my project i don't know how to purchase things so we found in ugc that there is a there is a need to create what is known as an r and d cell within the university system i am sure in your university you may be having maybe with some other name but an r and d cell to train our faculty members 
in writing successful project proposals after you get the project proposal how to manage my funds and once i do some basic research how to apply for a patent convert this basic research into applied research you see when i when i am talking about funding your <laughs> don't tell him about this <laughs> so how to turn this basic research into applied research how to set up a startup company we don't know so <clears throat> ugc has come up with guidelines for establishing this r and d cells and um, nearly about 600 universities have formed this r and d cells and i can give my own example when i shifted from iit to uh, jnu in 2016 uh, to my horror i found there was no r and d cell um, we established an r and d cell and within few years our r and d funding increased by about four times because people have become more aware and they were chasing funds um, and they could get more funds so this is something that we need to do and one very important thing that has happened just in the very recent past for funding is the establishment of the national research foundation and it has a um funding of 50000 crores in the coming 5 uh, years um and also it's highly competitive what is nice about this nrf is that you know i'm from iit system for too long we were giving too much of funding to the iits of course they deserve it but our university system has to be strengthened we cannot be a globally leading uh, research based you know knowledge based society unless our university system is strengthened and the focus of this nrf is precisely to do that to strengthen the university research ecosystem and um, um ugc will be there on behalf of a few fighting for funds from nrf so that we will strengthen the research ecosystem um in our universities please tell me when i have to stop in another 5 minutes <laughs> okay um there are various other things that we can discuss but i want to leave time for uh, questions but before i do that you know i began talking about bengali language and the love for bengali language and uh, um nep 2020 also talks about strengthening our own indian languages using indian languages in both school education system and also the higher education and ugc has taken up this task of uh, producing books required for ba bsc and bcom you know in ba you have another nine sub disciplines in bcom you have only one in bsc again you have nine uh, sub disciplines so for every sub discipline in these programs in 12 indian languages one of them being bengali also we want to bring out textbooks so that our students can whenever they find it difficult in english they can refer to um, the bengali book i often found in the classroom that some student may not be so proficient in english but they are good if they want to express something in their own language they can express um, beautifully and cognitive science also very clearly demonstrates through years of research that when we study in our own mother tongue in our own um the language that we use at home outside home our thinking power our creativity is significantly enhanced and that's the reason why nep 2020 uh, uh focuses on promoting our indian languages of course some people say that uh, um it, today we are globalized without english how can we do but nep doesn't say you neglect english learn english as a communication tool but use your mother tongue to become a good learner i wish i could speak in bengali um uh, today and uh, 
today he also made a little bit of compromise in the morning while speaking um he, he used a little bit of english and also bengali uh, for my sake <laughs> right so this is an open invitation to all um educators in higher educational institutions in west bengal um although i am speaking to you i know others are also listening online that uh, um there is an apex committee in ugc and uh, we will be contacting several educational institutions in different states in west bengal also we will contact the uh, academicians so please do participate in this project come forward and write books in bengali in different sub disciplines of bsc bcom and ba and these books will be hosted on a portal known as e kumbh e kumbh was launched by our honorary president in march in bhuvaneshwar um we already have several books in indian languages on e kumbh thousands and thousands of books are being downloaded and these books are free so don't you agree that we should actually bring out these books in, in our indian languages in our bengali lang language for the sake of our students and please do participate in large numbers friends i would like to uh stop here i would like to take more questions there are so many things to talk about um, nep but i know your thoughts are running elsewhere <laughs> right you are getting tired and it's quite natural you don't have to feel guilty about it so i will stop here and ask me any question that you want to ask Yes. Yes. <clears throat> I was in the IIT plan. Here I found this real degree that in students of physics they could have some other degree also in other subjects. Some of the uh, subjects. Mike, somewhere. You can go beyond that. Uh, that is an experiment um, which is done by in that institution but you can i will give you an example um i think we introduced that uh, after uh, professor vijay chakravarti's term was over in ec at jnu we have introduced a uh, bsc msc integrated program in ayurveda biology so the faculty members from school of biotechnology life sciences school of sanskrit studies uh social sciences all of them they run this program so this is looking at ayurveda which is our indian knowledge system from a modern perspective to come up with solutions which are affordable uh to even poor people those kind of things we can do by using the multidisciplinary approach and also you know 50 years ago if you wanted to predict after 10 years what kind of jobs might be there it was easy to predict but today you don't know after a couple of years what kind of jobs will come in the market and if you are only studying one subject for 5 years and you pass out and look around there is nobody to hire you because you don't have the required skills so you need to acquire multiple skills while you are a student right yes yeah I'm feeling Okay, some people must be high university student candidates. So IIT status, the finance university number one. And we are thinking too much about nowadays. Uh, Any, but in our discipline, most people are those who are teaching and coming to finance institution after long fight because there is a cultural uh, some kind of uh, problem. And at the same time, we are coming to the finance field. That 
But at the same time, there our practice is basically from the beginning, from the first year, very much interface. Everything even they are very much different original from this year. We appreciate their original from the same beginning. And when they're coming from the uh, post of PhD or research or this kind of thing, this area is neglected and mostly asked for this published paper. Mm -hmm. But we are not that much interested to publish paper because our publication is normally uh, in the other media. We, we publish in the school, we publish in the media, we publish in the book, we publish in different kind of material. So if we understand only this paper publication, and in that way, so this is, I think, uh, this is right, uh, right. Difficult is on our process. Uh, so that is okay. And at the same time, even we have noticed here in this a few days back in a meeting, our vice chancellor mentioned this thing also that Bishopharmacy is getting not getting the proper standard because of the uh, financing to be and other institutions only go on and go. Uh, yeah. Because they are not quick practice yes. So that's why they don't feel even uh, to have this kind of published paper. So that's why our practice is supported. At the same time, our promotion for this for very uh, genius uh, artists, they have a bigger contribution to this art scenery. Right. But they are not getting proper in down promotion, but I don't want to but they are not getting that proper testing. In that way, and uh, minors is nowadays even in the industry of the advanced country, they are just giving too much priority when they will not be artists, but they are giving too much priority because that's for the development of their people. Maybe right. they will be good for other practices. Right. Uh, right. So why they have uh, lacking this kind of priority for the finance practice? But this day, uh, if you allow me, I just would like to supplement you know, what you said. In fact, if you remember, I raised this issue in front of the president and also in front of the prime minister in Banaras, because our colleagues, the department of Pala Bhavon and Shongit Bhavon and Shilpo Shadar, they suffered a lot. Because you know, in the NIRF ranking, Vishwarati right. goes down because the NIRF people do not take into account the contribution, the great contribution mm -hmm. of these artists right. who do not have PhD, who may not have good papers in Scopus journals. Right. But you know, when they produce a sculpture, mm -hmm. when they you know sing a good song, when they you know prepare a beautiful landscape, so that are not assessed. As per uh, the assessment to use in case of published papers. Okay. So I think this is unfair. And since you are here and you matter a great deal in the decision making process, I'm very happy that Suril Babu has raised the issue, which I've been raising in many parts, you must have seen. And I think I request, uh, make an earnest request to you, not only on behalf of my colleagues in this department, but also on behalf of the students. Right. Will be and MS University of Baroda. And Banaras, this time I met Jain Saab and he also told the same thing. We have the three great universities having great departments of uh, arts and aesthetics and music, right. but they are suffering because of NIR uh, low ranking. Mm. Please, please and uh, raise this point uh, among those who matter in you know uh, preparing the NIRF ranking. For, for the MS University Boroda and Banaras in the University. Thank you. No, I wanted you to ask me a question, but I just now got lectured. Sunil Babu, thank you. <laughs> and he's also recording both of us to make sure what commitment we are going to make, whether we'll stick to that. Uh, but thank you, uh, Sunil Babu. You actually touched upon a very, very complex uh, issue. Because in our system, we tend to use one fits all kind of measures. And as he rightly said, in, in, in all areas, it's not possible to publish. In all areas, it's not possible to you know, get patent for your work. There are different ways of doing uh, creative work. 
and it, it is especially so in the case of fine arts and uh, similar kinds of uh, uh, disciplines and uh, um that is one of the reasons why you know we are also looking at the 2018 uh, guidelines the regulations that we have uh, which specifies the minimum qualifications for the faculty appointments and for their promotions um, we are going to revise these regulations and uh, introduce some kind of flexibility in these regulations so that the institutions can decide themselves what suits best for them in certain disciplines um, so they are not bound by one fits all kind of measures and the other uh, point that you have mentioned is that um, we have also for example uh, uh, sunil babu we have removed this mandatory publication requirement for phd thesis submission right students don't have to mandatorily submit you know publish a paper before you submit your uh, thesis that was too much uh, uh, stressful for the students because anybody who knows publishing um, they know that it it's a long process publishing a paper uh, is a long process especially when you want to publish in good journals and many people said no you know you are diluting the research we should you know we should let the phd students publish only then they should submit the thesis we said who says we should not publish let them publish at their own pace in a good journal so many such measures had to be brought in and also the discrepancies in nir of ranking um the nac accreditation also we are now working dr radhakrishnan the former isro chairman um he is chairing a committee of which i am also a member we are going to come up with a much more flexible um approach of the nirf ranking and also the nac accreditation so that many of these problems can be taken care of and uh, we are also coming up with what is known as um, one data one nation concept uh, you don't have to submit uh, data to nirf data to nac data to somebody else um, at one place you submit throughout the year you keep submitting and the respective agencies will pick up the data uh, from this database uh, so that uh, the load on on the faculty and on the universities is reduced so sir i i completely uh, agree with you as i said earlier the regulator has to be a facilitator provide broader guidelines but let the universities decide you know what they want to do uh, how they want to select how they want to promote uh, their faculty that has to be done actually actually what we do sir that whenever we want to make a regulation we put out the draft regulation on the ugc website and we write to all the vice chancellors so that some discussion takes place and feedback comes to us um and then we incorporate that feedback but the entities we don't have mm. maybe Okay. So how we can uh, find how we can find the proper representation of the person in body in terms of uh, the right. So right. they are they are thinking for something that way. Mm. So mm -hmm. that's why we don't have we don't have that much uh, because professors are the only. I'll I'll keep that in mind. I'll keep that in my mind. Okay. Right. Right. Any questions from the sure. students? Yeah. Ha. Huh. Please go ahead. And there are some questions on that. Mm, yes. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. I am Dr. Vivanthi Shubhashu. I am Somesh Shatner, PhD scholar from Agricultural Institute. Okay. Sir, uh, when we were discussing about the technology-driven education system, now it also poses some kind of uh, threats to our education. Artificial intelligence is penetrating deep into our education system. Hmm. Even as young researcher, we are feeling some kind of threats to our intellectual property, which we develop it. so uh, as mep or as ugc uh, in a whole how it will help us in having a very uh, holistic pattern as we were discussing about this holistic development and all so how they will help us in having a very uh, limited or safe uh, uh, workplace in not in terms of technology and what are the key areas you will suggest us as we are the budding uh, faculty of the future faculty members how will you suggest us so that we contribute very uh, efficiently to our effort right now it's a great question first of all 
as humans, we will continue to develop new technologies. New technologies will keep becoming available to us. The first thing that we need to do is get rid of any fear of new technologies. Number one. Number two, you know, when printing press was invented, there was a huge furor. Now it's going to affect our intellectual uh, power. Um, similarly, when nuclear power was invented, there was a huge, you know, a debate, discussion across the globe. But still today also we use nuclear uh, power for electricity generation. So when chat GPT came, you know, people said, you know, some people wrote to us, you write to all universities to ban chat GPT. No, you can't do that. We need to learn how to use the newer technologies to our benefit. Technologies are always a two-sided sword. It can hurt you. It can enhance uh, the quality of your life. So that is when the challenge lies. So similarly, when artificial intelligence is coming, people ask me, how does that help us in education, artificial intelligence? I'll give you one uh, simple example. I can have an AI app, a teacher in the classroom, what does the teacher do? The teacher reads, reads some two, three books, prepares notes, comes to the classroom and precisely teaches what the teacher knows from these textbooks. And the students make a note of that. Now I can build an AI machine and feed all this information in two, three textbooks. It will come and teach you exactly the same thing that the teacher, boring teacher is teaching, right? So that is first level of app. But the second one, there is another teacher. Ah, uh, he finds that there is a, his, in his face, there is a question mark. So did you follow what I said? He says, no, I found that difficult. What is the difficulty? I explained. And then I, I see another student. So now this is interactive mode. I can have another AI-based app where the app will pose a question to you. It will read, it will study your uh, responses and then decide how to give the information so that you can comprehend in a better way. So this is a kind of cooperative AI. So you are, you are talking to each other and information is flowing back and forth. But there is another teacher, you know, I, I often do when I give a quiz in my classroom, I have 200 first year students, electrical engineering, I give a quiz. And the first thought that comes to our mind is, you know, people may cheat from each, from each other notebooks. So you will put some 10 teaching assistants and say, be careful, anybody may be seeing here and there. So what I used to do, after I gave the quiz, and you can see the nice level going up in the classroom, people forming fast groups and working and discussing with each other and so on. You can bring up the player and players from 10 students, doctors, and teachers, they're mm -hmm. trying to solve a serious problem in a collaborative way. So there are different ways in which we can see the reason why. The teacher's role will now become a mentor. You don't have to teach. You will be saved by yourself. Now to reinvent yourself, therefore, teachers have to acquire new ideas. And to censor this now, we are, we are starting what is known as Malabia mission. As part of Malabia mission, uh, we are going to give a two weeks training on various aspects of teacher learning. Uh, the pedagogical approaches, the technologies that we have used, the newer technologies that we saw in education. So it's a two-week program. And in higher education, we have used about 15 lakh teachers, right from assistant to teachers. Um, this is going to be the hybrid mock two weeks program. Uh, the teacher will, the resource person will teach and they will take the questions and so on. And it's not a technical learning. I will say when the notification comes, all of these apply. Uh, online, we can apply and take these kind of uh, uh, training. So, the point that I'm making is that we are in your technology because as teachers, we must learn new things, otherwise, we will become out.
तो मेरा नाम उनके सामने था मैं इसके साथ मेरा क्वेश्चन ये है कि एनईपी 2020 में पिछले महीने की पुलिस को और भी शिक्षा पर निकल जाने के बाद में जो बड़ी-बड़ी चुनौतियों का सामना होगा पर आप क्या उन सब चुनौतियों को आप थोड़ा हम कृतिक काम कर सकते हैं और अभी कितना और समय लग सकता है आपके इंसान के पूरी तरह से लाभ मिलेगा दिस इज द न्यू कैरेक्टरिस्टिक ऑफ द यंग रेस्टलेस नोबेशंस एनी पी 2020 के 3 इयर्स अगो सी पी एस स्ट्रक्चरली वाई बैक पे इंप्लीमेंटेड ओवरनाइट आई वाज टोल्ड बाय एंड ट्राइड इन पर्सन व्हेन ही केम इन एंड द डिजाइन इज आर वेरी वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग एंड व्हेन यू विजिट द ऑफिसेस ऑफ डिजाइन इन ऑफिसर यू विल फाइंड अ बोर्ड ऑन देयर टेबल एंड डू यू नो व्हाट इज रिटन देयर What is written there? It says, "God give me patience because they are patient." Patience, but I want it right now. <laughs> so uh, you see, our country is too big, and it is too diverse. Um, and you, you know what? Nearly sixty percent of our colleges, forty-five thousand colleges, they are located in rural areas. nearly 45% of our universities are located in rural areas now to transform such a big system it requires a lot of effort um that's why it is taking time and the makers of nep 2020 are aware about this so they have set a goal for themselves that by 2035 let us achieve 50% gdp that is our goal but in order to climb up the everest which is our ultimate goal you need to do a lot of preparations at the ground um, and those preparations are being done now and first of all creating awareness is very very important first step which we have been doing i'm sure even in vishu bharati several seminars and um, webinars must have been uh, conducted and then what are the things that you can achieve immediately for example academic bank of credit national credit framework you know Uh, i don't want to go into details that will take time national credit framework is another one and you will not believe but in in few years every child will have a number called apar id assigned to the child as soon as the child joins in the bal vatika you know our school education system is 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 in the new education system so in the first 5 years balwatika 1 balwatika 2 balwatika 3 class 1 and class 2 so that is 5 years and then you will go to third fourth and fifth right so 3 years and another 3 years and then four four years 11th and 12th 9th and 10th so that is the four year period now every child will get this automated permanent uh account number apart right at the school level and the child's progress will be monitored and the credit uh, the credit earned by the child will be put in the academic bank of credit and you will have you will have no certificates hard copy certificates when you are moving from um, one college to the other college or college to the university or university to the employment your certificates will be there in the dg log the employer will check there your university will check there no fake certificates no loss of certificates everything will be monitored there so if you want to do that for 300 million students don't you think it will take time it will take time so my dear friend have some patience we will implement it there are some questions no online the portal the right yes Sir, one question is: What is relevance of CVT for BFA? If skill is what an artist should have, this is by others. Because by what is relevance of CVT for BFA? For BFA, Bachelor of Finance. Oh, Bachelor of Finance. Ah, uh, you see, for certain disciplines, we said you can take uh, certain percentage of CVT. 
and certain percentage for actual exam in the field. It could be sports, it could be um, performing arts, you assign certain marks and you add this. So the first part of CUET is required just to test your soft skills, um, your simple ability to solve problems, your general knowledge. We have one paper, uh, it's a general test. This general test can be taken by anybody and take 75% from there. Hypothetically, I'm saying 25% for the actual performing art test. So you can still do that. There's no problem. Yes, sir. The second question is that from Professor Adimondon Tipati, what is the plan of EGC for our endangered languages, especially with regard to recommendations of NEP 22? Correct. Um, language promotion is a top priority in NEP 2020. And endangered languages, we have already given funding to a few universities, and we are reviewing um, the progress of the work done by these universities. So based on that, we will refund these activities. But then another question from uh, Kashmir Central University, from Abdul Majid Baba, Lydan of the University. As for NEP 2020, there will be no EGC. How do you feel about it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I feel good about it. <laughs> Maybe I will be the last chairman of UGC. <laughs> uh, well, the idea behind HECI, the Higher Education Com Commission of India, is that today you have multiple regulators and people have to run to National Council for Teacher Education, AACT, UGC, and several other councils. We want to create what is known as ease of providing education, not ease of business, ease of providing education. So the idea is to merge all these regulators together so that you have one single window where you can go and apply. Two, beyond that, this new regulator should ensure that the regulations are produced based on evidence, based on the feedback from the stakeholders, based on certain priorities. And this new regulator should also ensure that they should study how the regulations are impacting the educational institutions. So whether you are coming up with regulations just because law empowers you or because there is a need to facilitate certain things. So the HECI is going to be in my view, is a biggest reform after independence, which will act as a catalyst uh, to strengthen higher education in India, both in higher education, technical education, vocational and skill education. All these things will be strengthened through the establishment of HECI. Thank you, sir. There is no more question, but there are many uh, comments, remarks in uh, Right. Uh, as a host, please send my thanks to them for their suggestions. And, uh, yes. Excellent. Um, so internship has become now an integral part of our education under NEP 2020. When we talk about internship, some images come in our mind. One, let's say I'm an engineering student. I will go to maybe LNT, if I'm an electrical engineering student, maybe I'll go to Intel or IBM to do my internship. Now we are saying, yes, you can continue to go, but we are widening the scope of the internship. Let's say I'm a computer science student. What stops me from doing an internship in a panchayat office in a rural area? I go and see how technology can help those people and I come up with certain solutions and go back to my institution. Um, what stops, for example, 
um, a BA sociology student from doing internship in, let's say, hospital. In a hospital, you study how patients and doctors are interacting, how patient support system is placed, how um, the people, the relatives, for example, how they are handled. No, it's a social problem in a hospital. So why can't you do the internship? So you have no bounds for creating these kind of internships. And UGC has very clearly said that there is a broader definition of internship and we need to move away from this narrow definition. So in any discipline, irrespective of humanities, social sciences, engineering, or any discipline, you can imagine to do internship in any field. Okay. So therefore, you can easily find out uh, places where you can send your students. You can even send uh, to uh, your students, for example, to see how a pottery, you know, a person who makes parts, let them go and spend 15 days with that person. Understand his or her life, um, the techniques he is using, and come back and make a report and make a presentation. That is learning about life, learning about the outside world. Because our students, you know, let me tell you, I was also a student. Um, when I was your age, we were in an idealized world. A university is an idealized world. Outside world is a non-idealized world. And if you suddenly pass from this idealized world to non-idealized world, you don't know how to react, how to respond to those newer situations that are coming. So therefore, in a controlled manner, you need to touch the non-ideal world and come back to your ideal world. And that is the intention. Yes, sir. Yes. This is the issue of the department of the My question is regarding the very much focused on the So, we are to Right. So we are uh, trying to do something new. As you told that we are young, we are in faculty. We are very much uh, uh, willing to do something in terms of research also. So if we uh, apply for any uh, project, research project, so funding are uh, problem. Earlier UC was providing funding to the and uh, one more problem that uh, all the funding, all the projects are given to the RIT schools. So, we are not getting any such projects. So, sir, please help the uh, uh, newly appointed assistant, assistant professors also, because then they will be motivated and they will be motivating the students also. They will be engaging them into the research also. I think this is the uh, one of the motives. Right, right, right. I will answer your second question first. I will be your defender, right, in NRM. I will fight for you to get more funds for the university system and college system. And the uh, first one is earlier, of course, UGC used to give funding under various schemes, but they were part of 10th plan, 11th plan, 12th plan. And after Niti Aayog came, those plan, planned way of funding, uh, that's not there anymore. Uh, so that's why now, meanwhile, NEP 2020 came. And as part of that, now NRF is being formed. And soon NRF will be funding. And what is interesting this time is that this is headed by both the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Science and Technology. Earlier, that was not so. And that's why most funding was going to IITs and such institutions. And just a few days ago, the Ministry uh, of Science and Technology, uh, the minister, he said that uh, this imbalance will be corrected now. Universities will start getting more funding. Yes, sir. I actually, my question was a follow up to the question that we don't have the more interventions. So, uh, and this, I'm speaking from a place of faith. So, please, uh, give your expert permission. Uh, what sort of formal certification would be available to students who do unorthodox internships of the kinds that we've been to? Uh, so, because I personally, I suffered in my time doing, you know, just, uh, 
I learned from people who were in informal spaces, and I learned a great deal, but I began to synthesize that learning into my academics because they weren't placed so as to give me any institutional certification. I it was troublesome to talk about that when I went to went to interviews or talk to seniors in my field about what I did. No, absolutely. I agree with you. Uh, our higher educational system was one of the most rigid system. You know, even though she was interested in doing that unorthodox internship, but the institution is not ready to give any credit for that. Today, that system is changed. Uh, today, students can do any kind of uh, internship and then they can get credits. And we are also now working on what is known as career learning recognition. Um, for example, skill education is one of the areas which is completely neglected in our country. Today, and you ask an engineering student to fix a tube light, he will struggle. Uh, right? Basic skills are missing. Um, so, how do we change this scenario? So, we are now integrating skill education also as part of the higher education um, and the uh, school education. And we want to make skill education also aspiration. For example, today, um, if I do ITI after 10th class, my neighbors and everybody will think that you now I'm a failure because I didn't get anything. I have gone to ITI. Oh. Now, those kind of negative perceptions are created. So people will not be interested in such things. Um, but under the new national credit framework, if I do 10th class and ITI, by doing one or two language courses, um, I will get a 12th standard certificate. And I can use that to join in any other higher education programs. So we need to do several such things in order to make uh, skill education, vocational education also aspirational. I just want to tell you, bordering what you have just been saying, there, there is a, a top Harvard uh, medical professor and when he was studying in Harvard itself, he found that they were so bookish when they actually went to the hospital to interact with the patients, they did not really know how to transfer this bookish knowledge into real life uh, interaction. Uh, so when he was a student, therefore, he went, he went and worked as a cleaner of a bus just to listen to conversations, people around people who are traveling in the buses, or he went and worked in a restaurant just to see outside world how it is. So developing these soft skills, understanding of the non-ideality of the world um, is very, very important. And that is part of our education now. I think let me see, we must stop. Yes, if the boss says stop, <laughs> I should stop. <laughs> so before we stop, I will just, uh, And holistic education is implemented in modern India during colonial times, began from Vishwabharati. In the model of natural progression from school to university. Now, the UGC is cartelling it, that's the problem. And our vice chancellor and very much. Problem. Mm. So why not the concept of university which is changing 360 degrees and in a holistic approach, it should make an effort to make the personality a model of a different type of university where university can come. Right. By getting a certain form of natural progression and also I am I am on your side. I am just saying this to ward off any trouble from you. <laughs> so we both are on the same side. I do agree. The kind of integrated education system that we have in Vishwabharati, I think it's a wonderful model. 
Um, but you see, universities are autonomous bodies. Um, even BHU, for example, has their own school. And I hear that uh, the students from the school here have certain percentage of seats allocated in the university, which is a very good thing because it will make aspirational for the students. So I do agree. But as I said, it is for the universities to decide what model they want to adopt. And UGC will be open-minded. And if you have any specific problems related to your university, please let me know. We'll sit together and see how we can resolve those problems. Um, and no, but I think uh, he will pull the microphone from me. <laughs> if you ask more Not questions. Sure. If you ask more questions, maybe after this, we will have a conversation. So before I um, conclude, I want to go back to the beginning point about the students I said, they want to become good learners. So I want to tell you, and this is, this is something that I tell my students in the first lecture every uh, that if you want to be a good learner, there is a very good solution given by Adi Shankara. Adi Shankara said that you need to do four things if you want to become a good learner. In those days, of course, he said in simple Sanskrit, Patanam, Mananam, Chintanam, Sankirtan. Patanam means you have to study. Mananam means whatever you study, you have to remember. Chintanam means what you have studied, what you have remembered, you have to critically think. Sankirtana means you have to repeat the whole process again and again. Study, remember, critically think. Study, remember, critically think. So this is what you need to do. So can I request all the students what you need to do? Four things. Start with me. Patanam. Mananam. Chintanam. Sankirtanam. Please do not forget this. Thank you. Uh, we end this discussion by making you know, the situation a little lighter. Uh, I agree with uh, Viplav that um, Vishwabharati provides holistic education and natural progression. But I think you stopped. I, I would like to go beyond what you say. For me, Vishwabharati is probably the only university which follows the model from KG to PG, right? Here, PG means pension and graduate. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Nima. Sir, word of thanks. So, we have just started off our today's 58th session of the Soros Lecture Series. As I have been entrusted to offer a lot of thanks at the very outset, let me just express that I have been filled privileged to offer a lot of thanks in this August gathering. And at the very outset, let me offer our heartfelt gratitude. Thanks and congratulations to none other than our today's speaker, Colonel Jagdish Sajji, the chairman EGC, and former vice chancellor Yen, and many more. But what I would like to mention is that this NEP 2020 is holistic, which of course, but point of today's speech was holistic, motivational, encouraging, and enlightening too. And with his thought provoking lecture advice, I think we will go ahead. And for this 58th lecture session, and we are having our honorable UGC chairman, sir, because of our catalytic role played by our honorable vice chancellor. In many forms, as in one way, this lecture series is one of his best child, which has been initiated in January 2019, soon after his joining November 2018. And all kinds of administrative supports offered by him to have staged this program in blended mode. And I'm happy to share that more than 450 participants enjoyed this session both in online and physical. Our register sir is here. Without his administrative support, it was next to difficult to ask to stage this program over here. 
And I would like to express thanks to all the Prime Minister, Deputy Minister, Mr. Minister for their unchanging effort to make this program a success. And our teachers and students from Sangeet Bhavan, those who have performed ethics son at the very starting, led by Sumanda and Sumam At last but not least, without having this August gathering, how one session will be motivational? How one session will be interactive? So last but not least, the students, Mr. Scholar, faculty members, principals, director, or officer, library officer, Mr. the Computer Center, Mr. the Library, and online participants who are from abroad, who are participants from Egypt, I found, and because parts of India, I found more than 200 participants was in online. So I think this is a kind of signaling message given by Chairman Sir through Mr. Varuti that what actually NEP is going to set our signal. So thank you all participants, physical and online mode, and thank you all for your precious support. And thank you, Dr. Vishnu, Yulari, Somo and Onirvan for their unchanging technological support to make the program a great success. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh,